All right, good morning. <laughs> my name is Carolyn Otto, and I am a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce this morning's MAA invited speaker, Dr. Abba. Abba obtained his PhD from the University of Iowa under the supervision of doctors Juliana Tomasco and Frederick Goodman. His area of interest in the field is in the field of combinatorics as related to areas such as combinatorial representation theory and algebraic geometry and topology. After completing a postdoctoral postdoctoral position at Bowdoin College, he came back to the Midwest. The University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire has the extreme privilege of having Abba as a tenure faculty member. It is at UWEC where Abba and I first officially met, became colleagues and friends. Watching Abba as an educator and mentor to undergraduate students has been both inspiring and motivating to our department. He is an excellent mathematician and colleague. His enthusiasm for math is contagious, and not just for mathematicians. It is common to see Abba out in the town and community doing math and sharing his passion for the subject with everyone. He loves to talk and learn any type of math. I recently asked some of our undergraduates to describe Abba in a couple of words. They responded with the following. Committed, caring, energetic, eccentric, inclusive, generous, and family. As many people in this room can attest, these words perfectly describe Abba. Abba is truly the heart of the UWC math family. Please join me in enthusiastically welcoming Dr. Abba. Hello. Um, thank you, Carolyn. That was adorable. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the MMA, MMA for inviting me to this session. I feel privileged, and this is a great honor, and I'm also ridiculously nervous. I did practice this talk at home, but it was slightly different. I, there was two people in the room. One of them was a non-math major student from my finite math class and uh, a visiting assistant professor. And well, I used the big room, so to, but this doesn't match the, um, the environment. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk, this, this talk is titled Two Research Projects Birthed from Curiosity, Recreation, and Joy. And um, essentially I'm going to talk about two projects that I've done with my undergraduates that spawned from an egg that uh, I didn't know what it was going to create. But it, it just, it brought all of my research students and I joy and it's just, I want to spread this joy with you. And hopefully you'll find it as enjoyable. Um, my first slide is, came from two days ago, I was attending a session on Generating Ideas, Undergraduate Research Project Ideas. It was an MAA workshop. And um, learning new mathematics with students is one of the greatest personal benefits of undergraduate research. This was on one of the slides uh, two days ago at Stefan Garcia from Pomona College. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to have gone to a lot of talks. I was, wasn't organizing a session this time. I wasn't. Uh, doing a bunch of other duties, so I had the chance to actually attend sessions, and I know some of you have been, haven't had that blessed um, ability because you're like working hard at other things or on the job market. Um, but this, this quote hit me because what I do at my undergraduates, it's kind of greedy. I don't know much about anything that I do with my research students before I start it. I do it because I'm interested in learning it. And I'm interested in the, the group of my students and I learning it together for the very first time. I'm not an expert in some of the stuff that I've done with my students, but it's, it's just a great opportunity to, to do that. And this quote just hit me when Stephen Garcia put this on the slide. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's why. That, that's one of the greatest personal benefits. I mean, I definitely enjoy my research with my PhD advisor and the crew of AMS special session people and algebraic combinatorics looking at the cohomology ring of a particular abstract algebraic variety and doing representation stability and all these things that I cannot do with my undergraduate students at that level. But I love these projects that just bring me joy and come from a, a seed that where I wouldn't think um, where it would lead. So let's talking about that. Let me introduce my um, collaborators for my first project. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to use this slide to say something. If you can read the blue stuff, great. If you can read Stefan Garcia's name, great. But that's not the font size of this whole talk. The font size of this whole talk will be, whoa, whoa, backward, sorry, would be this size. 
And it'd be great if you can read the subscript. If you can't read the subscript on that uh, math cal F, then you got to move forward because a lot of my research is on subsequences of a sequence. And the subsequences, the, all of the math is happening inside the subscripts. I mean, a good chunk of it. So if you cannot read this subscript, then come forward. I don't see anyone getting up. So I'm guessing everyone has better vision than me. I mean, these look great, but I need these. I mean, like, yeah? Yeah, OK. No movement? Can at least one person move forward? <laughs> OK. Oh, we got one. Yes. Yes. OK. That person will learn a lot more than the liars in the back who claim they can see that subscript. All right. Let's move on. So my, my collaborators, uh, Miko Scott uh, on the left, myself in the middle, and Dan Geyer were doing research uh, last summer during a music festival in Eau Claire. And that's possible. Um, this is the collaborators again at an Irish bar restaurant, too early for a beer. And we're working there hard. We had some food afterwards. A lot of good research can happen in a restaurant. Um, one of our main results is on this slide here. Majority of people seem to be over here. Ah, that's too far. OK. Um, this is one of our main results. I'm not going to show the details of the proof, but if you want to see the proof, um, just look carefully at that slide. Uh, the thing on the left, those three lemmas pretty much prove our main result on the right. This was done at a coffee shop in Eau Claire, a great place to do research. Me and my research students tend to travel around with these whiteboards and just like attack town. And um, as always, I have to buy them food, which uh, it gets expensive. So we go to the coffee shop. There's no food there, so I don't have to buy anything. Um, so uh, project one of two is the Fibonacci sequence modulo 10. Let's talk about the egg. Um, the two projects started with an egg. And I didn't know what was going to happen after we cracked the egg. But let's see what happened when we cracked it. What birthed it from this egg? Well, the following birthed. I saw a YouTube video, a 30-minute video, by a gentleman named David Cochran. And he talked about the Fibonacci sequence, modulo 10, and a connection to astrology. Nobody ran out the room yet. OK, good. Um, I want to say that he credits a gentleman named Brian Ray Payne for some of the observations that they made. Neither of these gentlemen are, in, are mathematicians by any means. And um, Brian Ray Payne also is not an astrologer, but David Cochran is. And they made some assertions, mostly on pentagram images inside this circle. I'm going to explain all those numbers on the outside uh, further in the talk. But basically, the talk was about, the, the video was about looking at patterns of the numbers that are hit when we look at, like, say, the blue square or the uh, color is that pentagon, uh, orange pentagon, or that, um, what is that, 12 sided figure in the dash red. Um, and looking at the numbers that are outside there, starting at the top, whoops, whoops, starting at the top. Uh, we have a sequence of numbers, and they circulate around clockwise back to the top, and there's 60 elements in that sequence. And then it repeats. Again, I'm going to get the details of where this sequence came up from very soon in the talk. But first of all, I just want to talk about the egg. The egg had no mathematics. When I saw this video, I immediately say, I can prove that. And like, students will love this. And, like, and then we went to town. We proved not only everything in the video, like, we went to town, like extremely to town. I mean, we went to the big city. All right, uh, next slide. OK, so what's the connection to astrology? There's 60 numbers in this circle. And there's only four zeros. On the top, there's a zero. On the left, there's a zero. On the right, there's a zero. On the bottom, there's a zero. Going counterclockwise from the top, we have Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. Those are the births of the tropical zodiac, the birth, the birth of a season. Aries is the birth of spring, right? Again, no hocus pocus here. I'm just talking about some astronomical facts. There's these names of constellations, right, in the, zod in the zodiac belt. Next one, we have eight sets of eight fives. They come in two sets of four. I'll talk about the first set first. Um, and on those fives, we have the middle of a tropical season. In the middle, middle of spring, uh, Taurus is born. In the middle of summer, Leo is born. In the middle of uh, fall, Scorpio is born. Let me point to these in case people don't know these. Everyone knows these symbols, right? <laughs> in the middle of winter, Aquarius is born. Those are those fives. What about the remaining four fives? Well, that's where we can put what's called, what astrologers call the mutable signs. At the end of a tropical season, at the end of spring, we have Gemini. At the end of summer, we have Virgo. At the end of fall, we have Sagittarius. Woo! Sorry, I just feel that. Um, at the end of winter, we have, sorry, at the end of, wait, wait. 
Yeah, at the end of fall, we have Sagittarius. At the end of the winter season, we have Pisces up at the top there. And then spring is born again. So, at, so it is convenient. The video pretty much started saying, look at the sequence of numbers, and it's cute. If we lay it around this, this, this um, circle in this fashion, um, we can find some astrological significance. That's not what I was concerned about when I was watching this video, although I have to admit I've been interested in astrology for 10, 15-ish years. Um, let, but let me, before I get into the hard math, let's look at something that you may have never seen. What is this? Well, it's a lot of stuff you can't actually make out. Uh, this is the astrological chart of Denver at 10, 10 a.m. How close is that to now? Is that like right now? Pretty five minutes ago? Okay, well, anyone five minutes ago who had a baby, uh, this is their, the chart of their, their baby. They have an Aquarius baby with a moon in Scorpio, um, Mars and Sagittarius, whatever. The astrological chart, just to explain it to you, is not hocus pocus stuff. This is the horizon, this is the ascendant, this is the descendant. We have the sun up here, that symbol, and the moon over here. In fact, last night I was having a hard time sleeping because I was a little bit nervous, but I, I mean, just because I put this chart in the thing, I knew that the sun was in square aspect to the moon, meaning that it subtended an arc of 90 degrees in the ecliptic, the 360 degree uh, um, circle that the sun traverses from the perspective of the earth as, a, as the sun moves. I mean, I know the sun doesn't move, but it makes some motion around some fixed stars, and those fixed stars is called the zodiac. And um, caveat, um, there's a sidereal astrology and there's a tropical astrology, and I'm doing tropical uh, for the astrology experts out there, if any. Um, so on the ascendant, what's rising right now is, happens to be Aries. And the sun's in uh, Aquarius. And we can, tonight, you, can, you notice that the, the moon is like on the left side of the moon, it's white. On the right side, it's not. And why is that? Well, the sun is literally left of the moon at a 90 degree subtendent angle in the zodiac. Blah, that's a, that's a half moon. So it's good to know this. I mean, we all live on this earth, but we, we sometimes look at that and we just don't we know why it's uh, waxing or waning or why it's to take, but we should. I mean, old, old folks of Europe, when, before the bright city lights, I, I'm sure lots of ancient folk um, did not take that for granted and knew a lot about that. But I mean, I grew up in New York City and there is, I mean, yeah, what could we see? All right, so let's move on to the math. Math, math, math. Enough of that. Is that all I want to say? Yeah, that's all I want to say about that. Okay. So, there's four main characters in the project number one. The first character in this unfolding drama is the Fibonacci sequence. Um, I'm going to denote F, capital F sub N, which is the standard notation. Uh, the set of integers, modulo N, and a brief introduction to modular arithmetic. I might go fast through that, um, because most of us in the room know modular arithmetic, but I also want to put it in there in case there is at least one or two, because it's an important aspect of the talk. Um, and then the Fibonacci sequence modulo 10, I'm going to do math cal, I'll just call it curly F, uh, 10 comma N, the double index scrimship, the first index just says it's the modulo. Eventually, I want to extend this to all moduli, but uh, so I'm keeping that 10 in there, although it's never going to change. That left subscript, this is going to be kicking it the whole time. Um, and, but the right subscript is giving you the index that's changing, the N. And then a connection to the astrological zodiac, Actually, I think I did that already. Um, and then the research content. I'm going to give a alliteration here. A plethora of pleasing patterns um, <laughs> in the subsequences of the following form. Uh, F sub 10 comma K plus RJ. J going from 0 to infinity. Subsequences of our apparent sequence of the mod modulo 10 Fibonacci sequence. OK, let's start. Um, rabbits that never die and constantly mate. This is important. Um, so let's unbox Fibonacci. Uh, first of all, there is nobody who ever walked the earth whose name is Fibonacci. Let's set that straight, all right? Cool. Um, he was Leonardo Bonacci of Pisa, and um, we sometimes go by uh, Leonardo Pisano, like from, from Pisa. And some setting some facts straight, why do people lie and think that Fibonacci is actually a person? Well, it's the, from the Latin Filius Bonacci. Son of Bonacci, his dad, his family's name is Bonacci, and Bonacci is plural, so it's like saying in, in the States, like saying the Smiths, like we pluralize that name because he's part of the Bonaccis, you know, the son of Bonacci. So that, that's where we go. That's why Leonardo is called Fibonacci, and I, I'll call him Fibonacci. Okay, so um, 
He posed a problem in his famous text, Liber Abaci, in 1202. This is uh, hypothetical and extremely biologically unrealistic. Unreal but we have a newborn pair of rabbits, uh, one male, one female, and they're put into a field. And then the question asked in this text was, how many rabbits can be produced from that one pair uh, in a year if the following constraints hold? Constraint one, the rabbits live forever. That's not possible, but rabbits live forever. Um, when giving birth, a male and female pair of rabbits will give birth to another male and female pair. Also not realistic. No rabbits have any issues with inbreeding or incest. Um, people don't mention that when they talk about this, but I just had to put that down there in case someone's like, no, but uh, just, just no, let's the rabbit's way. Um, every month, each adult pair begets a new young pair of rabbits, which from that second month onwards becomes productive. Okay, so I got some visuals to make this really, really clear. So we start with um, two rabbits on the first month. We want to get Fibonacci number one. How many rabbits do we have? One. That is called Fibonacci number one. Incidentally, Fibonacci number zero uh, is zero. Um, so we have Ali and Al, aren't they cute? They're put into a field. So a month later, they grow up to become adults. And there they are, grown up. Uh, notice they, uh, her, their fur changed a little, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, but that happens. You know, sometimes you give birth and the kids got like, I, I had straight hairish because my mom's Filipino and my dad's Kenyan. But, you know, but things change as you grow up. Uh, so here's Ali and Al. They're full grown adults. They're prepared to mate. Um, so the second Fibonacci number is also one. Um, the third month, the Ali and Al give birth to their proud uh, children, their Bella and Ben. So now we have Fibonacci number three. Bella and Ben grow up, uh, but they can't, they can't not uh, have incest, oh, sorry, they cannot mate yet um, because they have not been a full sequence of two months. But they're growing up, but Allie and Al have yet another pair of children named Cora and Cruz. So we have Fibonacci number four, which is number three. And now Cora and Cruz are growing up. Um, Bella and Ben give birth proudly to Edith and Elijah, while Allie and Al give birth to Diego and um, Dahlia, Dahlia and Diego. Uh, I'm not making these names up. This really happened, by the way. I saw this happen. Okay, and now <laughs> Diego, uh, the kids are now grown up, and the three kids below, this is the important part. Uh, now we're seeing this, what's happening here. The three newborns come from what were previously were the three that were ready to give birth. So the next time, I'm obviously going to have eight full-grown people, and how many children will be born? Five more from the five full-grown that happened in the next month. So I'm going to be done with this slides because maybe it's better to make a table. This is what's been happening. Fibonacci number six is number eight. Um, Fibonacci number, what are the next three months? Well, Fibonacci number seven is 13. Fibonacci number eight is 21. Fibonacci number nine is 34, et cetera, et cetera. What happens at the end of the 13th month? That will be a full, uh, sorry, at the end of the uh, beginning of the 13th month, that will be one full year. We have this many adult rabbits. Sorry, by the way, I keep on pressing the the pointer thing instead of the clicker, so I'm like shining things on people. I'm gonna learn to stop doing that. Sorry, Chris, mostly. <laughs> I haven't hit, been hitting you? Okay, I feel like I have. Okay, 144 adult pairs, which is incidentally Fibonacci number 12, um, and we need some, uh, some of the little ones. How many little ones do they have? And, shameless plug for our school's logo, um, 89 pairs of newborn rabbits for a grand total of 233 rabbit pairs at the end of one year. Whew! That's Fibonacci number 13. It's important to remember that. I will quiz you on that. That will happen at some point. But remember, 233 three is Fibonacci 13. All right. So let's have a math slide finally. The Fibonacci sequence um, is defined by the following recursion relation. We have uh, the n Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. Everyone in this room absolutely knows that. But does everyone in the room know that there's a simple closed form for it, the following Benet's formula? Let's go over here for a second. This wonderful looking formula um, gives a closed form. So what you have to marvel at is that there's all these irrational numbers running around, but the Fibonacci sequence is purely integers. So I, you should just marvel at by plugging in an N, you get an integer. And that, I mean, that's wonderful. This is pleasing. And it can be even more pleasing because there's a character in there that I hope you all know. Um, does anyone recognize that uh, thing? And if you don't recognize it, you didn't move up to the front. You can't even see what it is. But what is that thing? 
You can just yell, no, yell it out. Don't use the microphone. Just yell it out. You know it. Give it one of its many names. Golden ratio. Give another name. Fee. Give another name. How about the divine proportion? I, I mean, it's, it's badass. Can I say that? Okay, but it, it's, it's an amazing, well, it's just an amazing little ratio. And um, let's take a peek at um, what we can do with this. Uh, so the golden ratio appears in the first summand. What's the second summand? Well, that's one minus the golden ratio, which, due to the beautiful divine properties of the golden ratio, is equal to negative its reciprocal. So we can actually write Benet's formula up here in this nice, tantalizing, simple, compact, beautiful, oh, yes, feel it. A lot of the proofs that my research students did to connect this and another object called Lucas numbers was by um, utilizing this, this form. Speaking of, I just said a word named Lucas. Uh, I, 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 there's nothing in this talk really is going to be about Lucas, but it's important to know that there was a person 600 years after Fibonacci who basically brought Fibonacci to us. Um, and his name was Edward Lucas. So there's a sequence as follows. Um, it's, just like the Fibonacci sequence, you get the nth Lucas number from adding the previous two Lucas numbers. The only difference is now the seed is different. Two and one are the starting seed. In the Fibonacci sequence, zero and one was the starting seed. Actually, I didn't say that. I don't remember saying that from the previous slide, but you probably read it. The starting two numbers in the Lucas sequence is two and one, and then you add the two and the one to get the next number. Three, you add the one and three to get four. You add the three and four to get seven, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like, how is this thing interesting? Well. It, look at the closed form. The closed form looks scarily like um, the Binet formula for the Fibonacci sequence. It's all, it's all it's missing is the 1 over root 5 here. This, the negative from there became a positive. But it's just also still marvel that this is an integer. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Um, but it's got intimate connections with the Fibonacci sequence as follows. Um, the nth Lucas number is the sum of the uh, n minus 1 Fibonacci number plus the n plus 1 Fibonacci number. That's cool. And there's like 150 other identities that are like really trivial. And like we, me and my research students proved them all. And then there's like a thousand other ones that connect these. And I, we wouldn't have got any research done if we proved everything. But it was, oh my gosh, we spent 80 pages of LaTeX code just like, we, well, in order to do this project, I, I told them we need to become the experts, you know, at least in every known identity that's, that's uh, famous. So we did that. But um, Lucas, there we go. That's done. There will be a quiz on Lucas a little bit later, though. So here are the first uh, 30 Fibonacci numbers. And um, let's play around with these in the next few slides. So let's arrange those 30 numbers in rows of length 3. So they're going left to right, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. Does anyone see anything interesting? You're welcome to yell. Yell. Parody! Sorry, wait, I don't need to yell. Parody. <laughs> um, parody. That's it. It goes odd, odd, even, odd, odd, even, odd, odd, even. Hmm. So. The last column, we observed that everything is even. So the subscript of the last column are f sub multiples of 3. The subscript is a multiple of 3. So if 3 divides the subscript, 2 divides f sub n. In fact, the converse holds. Let's arrange them in rows of length 4. What do we know about the last column? Let's think about this. Parity is not the answer here, because we can look at those columns. We've got mixes of odds and evens. But the, third col the fourth column has something going on. All our numbers divisible by? Three, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, they're all divisible by three. So if four divides the subscript, then the Fibonacci number is divisible by three. Let's play this game a little harder. Rows of length six, last column. Well, I mean, I guess if we're doing the order, the first answer is divisible by two. The next one was divisible by three. It's just be divisible by four. Is that the right? I mean. Well, they are all divisible by four, but can we do better? I'll give you a hint, because obviously no one in the room has studied their multipl eight multiplication tables this morning. Um, they're all obviously multiples of eight. Actually, they're kind of like obviously multiples of eight. Uh, we know that the number is divisible by two if 
the, uh, fir the last digit is divisible by 2. The number is divisible by 4. The uh, last two digits divisible by 4. The number is divisible by 8. The last three digits divisible by 8. But that really won't help us here because these numbers are getting kind of big. Actually, well, this one we know. 0, 4, 0. That's divisible by 8, you know, because there's just 40 there. But, um, but yeah, so the, what we learned here is that uh, so if 6 divides the subscript, then the nth Fibonacci number is divisible by 8. And in fact, the converse holds. What's happening in general here is the following. Uh, f sub m divides f sub n if m divides n. So in particular, we have three uh, of the results that we, I just showed you here. And the one with, involving the 5 is new. But how do I just use the previous, this, this, this proposition to prove that? If 3 divides n, then f sub 3 must divide f sub n. But what is the third Fibonacci number? The third Fibonacci number is 2. And if 4 divides n, then the fourth Fibonacci should divide f sub n. The fourth Fibonacci is 3. So this is kind of powerful, kind of groovy, and definitely at the heart of what we were looking at um, when we go to modulo 10 scenario. OK. Whew. Allie's tired. But I like what, uh, I'm sorry, Al is tired, but I like what Ali says. You're tired. I'm the one who gave birth to all 22 of our children. Whew. OK, so let's move on. Hey, nobody giggled at that. I thought that was a joke in my head, but maybe not. OK, um, maybe it's just like one of those reality moments. I mean, you have to like, respect motherhood because um, oh, my friend Kim has a new baby, Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Oh, got to wave. OK, motherhood, wonderful. Um, so a brief introduction to modular arithmetic. As I said, I will go through this fast because everyone in the room has probably had this, but you can maybe use a refresher, and it's really important to know. So this is kind of the way I teach modular arithmetic and discrete math and abstract algebra. I, um, well, I started doing this after I learned to, well, after I stole some tech code that had a clock and learned how to change the code. <laughs> but uh, two clocks, 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock. What do you get if you add them up? 15 o'clock, right? And why is we get 15 o'clock, which is essentially 3 o'clock. And we all know this because it's maybe like army time. Um, 10 hundred hours, sorry, I, don't, I can't pretend to know military time, but 10 hundred hours and 500 hours is 1,500 hours, but that's just 3 o'clock. You just remove multiples of 12. So, um, so in some sense, 15 is equivalent to 3 with respect to 12. Moreover, 27 is equivalent to 3 um, with respect to 12 also. Well, why? Because 27 is 12 more hours past 15. Um, and also, we can go negative. Negative 21 is equivalent to 3 with respect to 12, because I can add two multiples of 12, naming the number 24, to get 3. Um, and also, why is 15 equivalent to negative 21? Well, we already did the previous two problems. If I know they're both, if they're both equivalent to 3, then they both must be equivalent to each other. So we're learning some sort of properties that in this uh, relation that I'm going to make clear. So we write this symbol, 15 triple equals symbol um, uh, negative 21 and mod 12 to express that 15 is equivalent to negative 21. So rigorously in math, what do we have? We have this congruence. That's the name of triple equals. So let n be greater than 1. Uh, two integers are congruent modulo n if n divides their difference, i.e. n is uh, a minus b is a multiple of n. If so, we write a is congruent to b. So the symbol is similar to equality in the following sense. Um, we have an, an integer is always congruent to itself, mod any n. If an integer a is congruent to an integer b, then the integer b is congruent to the integer a. That's called the symmetric property. And lastly, what we saw in the previous slide um, in that third example, if an integer a is equivalent, sorry, congruent to b and b is congruent to c, then a must be congruent to c. We have the transitive property. Woo! We have all three things. What do we have? What kind of relation? Equivalence. Equivalence. Woo! Yay! You all did your homework. Equivalence relation is what we had. Um, so if we have an equivalence relation, then we can take the set that the relation's on, and we can partition the set into classes. In this case, we have uh, the following definition. Uh, we're going to use a bar to denote all the, the residue class module n. Those are going to be all the integers x, such that x is congruent to a mod n. For example, and also we choose to use a least residue system, and we're going to talk about that. Let me talk about that by an example. Um, so if n is equal to 3, we have 0 bar, 1 bar, and 2 bar to denote the three equivalent classes that partition the integers. Every integer is in exactly one and only one of these classes. 0 bar is all the multiples of 3, 1 bar is all the numbers 1 more than multiple of 3, and 2 bar is all the numbers 2 more than multiple of 3. 
So let's go to modulo 10, because that's what we care about. Integers modulo 10 is way easy to understand. Um, here we have, we have 10 congruence classes, 0 bar up to 9 bar. And question, why is it easy to know which class a non-negative integer belongs in mod 10 land? Oh, where or oh, where does the number 79 live? Which class? Nine bar! Just look at the far right digit, the unit digit, yes. So, you now know all the modular arithmetic to understand this talk, and then you can generalize this talk to mod m later, uh, or even during the talk. Um, so, let's talk about Fibonacci sequence modulo 10. Um, first, let's recall and establish some new notation some new notation and some old notation. So we have the Fibonacci sequence, f sub n. The nth Fibonacci number is going to be denoted curly f 10 comma n. Uh, and then we're going to have the sequence. That's the, our notation for the Fibonacci sequence modulo n. So what we care about um, is, well, first of all, if we take a look at this ton of numbers. There's, these are 91 numbers. What do we notice here? It repeats eventually. First of all, we do notice it observes a Fibonacci-esque relation in terms of the following. If I took, like here, 6 plus 1 is 7, 1 plus 7 is 8, 7 plus 8 is 15, but mod 10, that's a 5. 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 1 is 9, etc. This observes the Fibonacci relation. So if we ever, ever see a 0 followed by a 1, we know it starts again. And that, that's actually in your head, you can think about why the Fibonacci sequence modulo any, any number m will always be periodic. It's bound to happen because you're thinking about how many ways can I have two pairs of numbers? Eventually, you're going to run out of like distinct pairs and there's going to be a zero and a one again at some point. So trivial proof, Lagrange did that in the 1700s. So, um, so why, what do we observe? That's when it starts again, right there after 60 numbers. And as I said before, there's this Fibonacci-esque relation on the subscripts. By the way, I highlighted them in case I knew people were going to move. So all the action that's happening in subscripts will be read for your pleasure. Um, if the nth one plus the n plus first is the n plus second uh, modulo 10 Fibonacci number. Okay. OMG, WTF. That's what the sad dog says. The sad dog will come up occasionally. Um, so Lagrange, as I said, declared this long ago, length 60, and D.D. Wall, a lot of our research came from this paper um, where he studied the uh, uh, Fibonacci, well, the first one to prove rigorously this, and then all the other papers were offshoots from there from 1960, mostly in the Fibonacci quarterly. Okay, let's talk about our research. We have the numbers here, 0 through 60 on the circle. Um, so we can talk about the infinite sequence because uh, this is f0, but I can also call this f60. To the right of it is f61, f62. Over here, this is f75 and also f15. We can just take the subscripts right index and mod that by 60. So we have an infinite sequence, but it does repeat every 60. Um, so we're going to look at subsequences of the form f sub 10 comma k plus rj. So what is the k, r, and j? Well, k is the starting position in our circle. And I'm going to do an example, by the way, after I do all this. r is the jump size. We're always going to jump a regular number of points in the circle with 60 vertices. Um, so if k is 1 and r is 15, then we get the following subsequence. The second index tells us the action. We're starting at the first number. Um, which is just right of the, the, the top of the circle. And then we're going to jump 15 units to the 16th number, jump six, 15 units to the 31st number, to the 46th, and we get the sequence of numbers. Let's do this more visually. We call this, by the way, a square aspect because it's going to make a square. If you divide 60 into 15s, of course, you're going to get four, four vertices that it's going to hit and then cycle again. But let's uh, wow you with like, the wonders of uh, LaTeX, in particular, a ticks package. Okay. Whew, you should see this code, by the way. Um, so we jump from the, the first k equals 1 to k equals 16. We get the numbers 1 and 7. And yeah, and actually, I was unfair. I don't expect you to be able to read any of these numbers, even barely from the front row, which is why I'm putting them down there. These are the numbers hit on that first vertex, and then the second is a 7. After that, take another 15 units, we get a 9. After that, we get a 3. After that, we go back to the 1, and then it goes on again. So that subsequence produces 1, 7, 9, 3, 1, 7, 9, 3. But that's when I started k equals 1. What if I started k equals 2? I get the same sequence. So what we're actually seeing here is some things that we may not have noticed in the Fibonacci sequence, but the last digits on the numbers that are 15 apart at least share this when the number is 
uh, when the starting position is 1 mod 15 and 2 mod 15? What if it's 3 mod 15? Well, then we get this 2, 4, 8, 6. What if it's, we start at the fourth position? So we're looking at numbers that are 4 mod 15. Um, we get 3, 1, 7, 9. We get that, those same numbers again. And a lot of people here who in group theory are like, those are, that's like the multiplicative group of Z10. You know, and, and that comes up. There's a lot of group theory happening in, in this project, too. Um, and if we start at the fifth position, we have all fives. That's trivial. Start at the top position, which I didn't do, we get all zeros. But essentially, we can make a table of all the possible values. And if I know the first 15 starting points from k equals 0 to k equals 14, I know them all because, like, basically, when I'm looking at this square, if I wanted to know what happens if I, wait, this square, if I wanted to know what happens if I start at the um, 25th position, no, sorry, that's 15, 20th position, I already know that if I know what happens in the fifth position. So we only need to know the first 14, 15 rows of that, of that data. So questions that we, can, that we asked. Um, well, first of all, things that we noticed. Each, exactly four types of cycles appear. Each cycle contains only odd or only even values. The four cycles are the following, blah. There's a direct connection between the cycles above and the following sequences. And this is an interesting research question. And I, we asked, like, I don't know, maybe 100 different research questions. I actually, at this point, don't even remember if we answered this. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, meaning answer it like directly, find a direct reason why um, the k Fibonacci number from these different starting values give the powers of these particular numbers. Um, let's look more at other things we looked at. What's a quasi Fibonacci sequence? That's a sequence where the jth one plus the j plus first one gives the j plus second one, and no matter what uh, starting point we start at. Uh, so we can ask ourselves, which R values is the subsequence quasi-Fibonacci for all K values? And for those K values not appearing, which ones, if any, are quasi-Fibonacci? We answered this in total by looking at exhaustively all of them. And so, for instance, let's look at if we start at the third position and jump units of 25. I'm going to put the numbers up top in the band instead of what I did before. If we jump another 25 units, I get... So, we, so far we have two, one, and three. Jump another 25 units, I jump to four. Another 25 units, seven, boom, 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 boom. If you jump 25 units, we realize that, whoops, we get that sequence of numbers. Two, one, three, four, seven, one, eight, nine. So we get tuples of size 12. What are all the possible tuples? Well, these are all the possible tuples. As I said before, I don't need to know any more of these rows for the same reason I said before. Um, and I won't even get into that for time's sake. Um, so what do we notice? Observation two, this is a quasi-Fibonacci sequence because if we go back to that. I had a two, one, three, four, seven, for instance. And all of these rows, most of them which you cannot see, uh, successive numbers sum to the next one mod 10. And by observation one, that means all of them, no matter what the starting value, would be quasi-Fibonacci. So that leads to our main result, one of our main results. Um, oh, first of all, does anyone notice the elephant in this room? Judging from the people here, where is the elephant? Probably there. What's up with those numbers? Lucas! The Lucas sequence appears. It creeped in there. That, that like, actually creeped us out, I think, uh, my research students and I. It was, it actually, it was just adorable. Um, but in any case, Thank you, Edward Lucas. Uh, so our results on the quasi-Fibonacci sequence is the following. If R is congruent to 1 mod 4 and R does not divide 3, then the J plus J plus first one equals the J plus second one. So that's interesting. So now we've classified all of them. Uh, what, R is equals 25 is the thing we just saw before. 25 indeed is congruent to 1 mod 4 and 3 does not divide it. And it was quasi-Fibonacci and we proved this and it was a very beautiful proof. Um, and if R is congruent to 3 mod 4 and 3 does not divide it, we get the backwards thing. J plus second plus the J plus first gives the previous one, the Jth one. So we get a reverse Fibonacci sequence. Um, so curiosity, recreation, and joy defines what are the most beautiful subsequences. Well, I don't want to, by the way, I'm going to pause for a second. I realize that when I practice this, I had plenty of time for both projects. You know what's going to happen? We may not see the other one. Hmm. But I'm not going to rush through this so that I, you can understand very little. I do this when I'm teaching. Sorry, sorry. No, I mean, I don't do that when I'm teaching. I'm just saying, 
it's better to understand half of this talk, about two thirds of this talk, than for me to speed through beautiful stuff and you understand very little. So I'm now gonna just make it, because I was like going fast on my, a tad, okay, thank you. <laughs> that was very nice. How do we define beauty? Um, well, these will be subsequences. Let me move over here so I can read this better. Subsequences of this form uh, of the original subsequence, of the original sequence, which themselves coincide with their parent sequence. So let's give an example when we jump R equals 49. I mean, this is so cool. You're going to just like talk to your family about this afterwards. But so let's look at the R equals 49 example. So I'm going to start at the very bottom. The very bottom of that is the 30th Fibonacci number mod 10. And I'm going to go 49 units clockwise. But what is 49 units clockwise? That's like going 11 units counterclockwise, right? So we can just see forward motion as that. So I start at the number zero at the bottom. I go 49 units to the right or 11 backwards, and that I get the number one. 40, uh, 90 more units, I get the number one, then I get the number two. Let's do some more. Boom, bidi boom, boom, bidi boom. If I do them all, whoa. This is like really surprising. Those sequence of numbers that we got, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, by jumping 49 units clockwise, that's the original sequence. Wow. Wow. I mean, I got goosebumps right now, and I got goosebumps because I still find this really exciting. Like, this is surprising. This is the definition of joy. This is the definition of recreation. This is the definition of curiosity. Because, like, why is this happening? Well, I mean, me and two other people in this room know why. But, like, why? Because well, we had to know why. Actually, we have partial whys. Let me tell you the exact result. The exact result is beautiful, too. But we, got, we generated the exact same sequence as if we had started at the top and went one unit at a time instead of going 49 units at a time. But, um, the exact result is the following. Let chi 10 be all the, the jump sizes are such that it's relatively primed to 60. And for each k in 0 to 59 and r in chi 10, the following holds. If r is congruent to 1 mod 4, the subsequences, k plus rj, coincide with the original sequence. But the original sequence starting at some n that's dependent on the k and the r value. But from that value on, it'll coincide. I picked the sequence that started at a zero and the next number was one. But I, if I pick any sequence and jump 49 units, I'm eventually going to get zero, one, one, two, three, no matter where I start. I started at a pretty one because I wanted it to look like zero, one, one from the very beginning, not after 17 terms or something. Um, so if R is congruent to three mod four, then the sequence co coincides with the original sequence starting from some n dependent on k and r, n sub kr, but going in reverse uh, in the circle. Um, so we call the value n sub k r a magic carrot. So in our proofs that we've done, we only know the existence, but we're so close to predicting the exact precise value of what n sub k r is. Um, well, we just need, well, I mean, there's probably quicker routes, but we know one route definitely is by proving the following conjecture. Something that's also, alone, this is very surprising. If you have a number relatively prime to 60, so that's the numbers um, in chi 10, and it's congruent to one mod four, then the, the rth, this rth Fibonacci number will be r itself, will be the last number of r. Like this um, 59th Fibonacci number will, oh shoot, that's a bad example. That's not one more than the multiple of four. The uh, 50, 49th Fibonacci number is congruent to nine. The 17th Fibonacci number is congruent to seven. But what if you are three more than a multiple of four and also one of those numbers? Like, for example, 59. 59 will be congruent to negative nine mod 10. In other words, it'll be congruent to one. So this is just a beautiful result. And also mod m, the generalization probably is, it will be a fun number theory project. And I'm sure someone's probably thinking of a solution right now to our conjecture. Um, we can prove the top if we can prove the bottom. This, this is another sequence that just kind of stumbled upon us. n to the n. Mod 10. Eventually, this is, uh, this is periodic of length 20. But what we notice is the following. If r is in chi 10 and r is congruent to 1 mod 4, then r to the r is congruent to r mod 10. And if r is congruent to 3 mod 10, then 
r to the r is congruent to negative r mod 10. <laughs> That's cool. Both of these are cool. These, both of these are related. And I think the re only reason I'm kind of tempted to tell the students and us to like go this route is because this other thing just seems so cool also. And so instead of like proving directly, um, well, I wanted to show that these two things are, are equivalent to each other. It's just, yeah, um, beautiful. Um, so I'm getting emotional a little bit here because I, I like this stuff. Um, and I'm an emotional guy. So. Uh, everything we did was modulo 10 setting, but of course it's natural to ask what happens to another moduli. Which of our results was generalized to those settings? And um, well, we had another egg to fry, uh, and I'm going to say let's move on to that egg. But you know what I'm going to do for like two minutes? I'm going to like jump to just some cute little things just to show you a tiny bit of the egg that I don't have time to talk about, since it says I have about five-ish minutes. And anyone who has questions for me about the other thing, I'm here. Till tomorrow, just please find me. But um, Miko's a Leo, by the way, and Dan is a tourist. Uh, the next project I did was one of those projects at UWC that I like to do with students where I, they don't get paid anything. All of our research students get paid, but sometimes I have research students that just want to do research for the fun and love of research. And on the, like the day after finals ended, I asked Rita, the, who's in this photo, the, that uh, would you like to um, work on a project right now? Take no break. And I was like, I saw a four by four matrix, and I, it has the golden ratio as one of its uh, eigenvalues. And uh, in fact, if I increase this matrix, I see it again, and every time I increase the, the ratio by five, uh, multiple of five rows and five columns. And uh, she was like, sure, but I have to go to Memorial Day party at my family's. And I was like, no problem, just invite me and I'll bring my whiteboards. I got a free meal. <laughs> So we went there and we started our research at her um, uncle Mike and um, oh, I forget now. Uh, the whole family was there though, and it was wonderful. And they think she's a nerd. Um, so and also that explains the outfit. I mean, I don't like yeah. It's Memorial Day, so I figured I'd look like a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, so uh, just a, a little bit. The project happened with this matrix. This is a. 4x4 four four matrix, unassuming matrix, zeros in the diagonal. The paper that I read was four pages long, had a half page of, of, of references. There's, but how could I get joy from this? Well, the joy was seeing the, um, the golden ratio come out as one of the four eigenvalues. The other uh, four eigenvalues was negative the golden ratio, and then the golden ratio inverse and negative the inverse. So I was like, this is substantially kind of cool. Let's look at all the other ones. And just quickly, um, I'm going to do something horrible. I'm going to advance and just say, see what's interesting. I kind of wanted to show you, like, okay, don't look at all this. Okay, but Pascal's triangle. We all know what Pascal's triangle is, but when we look at the characteristic polynomials, all of the coefficients are numbers in the damn triangle. And in a nice way, I color coded them for like people to see how beautiful this is. Um, by the way, I gave the version of this in a 10 minute version once, and it was easily uh, like tangible. Um, like in fact, actually, at a JMM once. Um, but I'm going to skip ahead again a tiny bit to talk about something even more beautiful. Um, the, the, the coefficients come from these slanty diagonals. These slanty diagonals here, not the colored diagonals, but these slanty, they're like the 12th characteristic polynomial has coefficient 1, 11, 45, 84, et cetera. There's a connection between these numbers and the Fibonacci sequence, which you're never going to hear about. Come up, Carolyn. Please do. Um, you're never going to hear, but come up, Carolyn, please. Um, oh, man. You got to download the paper, actually. It's just like, it's just too beautiful. Um, OK, well, I did. Can I just ask that one question to the whole crowd? OK. The <laughs> Okay, the, this conjecture. This conjecture came from two days ago. Uh, F's, the nth characteristic polynomial, when it equals the n plus first Fibonacci number, all the roots lie on an ellipse, a perfect ellipse. 
uh, for no matter which one it is. Like f sub n of lambda is f sub n plus 1. And come up to me and talk to me, because I'm still boggled by this. It might be trivial. Like maybe always the roots lie on that. But I think these characteristic polynomials are beautiful, because when I don't have, when I change one single variable, like the sorry, coefficient, I change that negative 3 from negative 351 to negative 350, and all of a sudden I get something that looks like a bad hamburger, you know? But everything else is a happy flying saucer. And uh, why? 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 Um, and that was two days ago. Um, research happens fast at the JMM, I guess. Um, so that's the end. I'm going to go to that slide that says I'm done. Those are the references to the two eggs. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right, we are actually out of time. So if you want to ask questions to Ava, like he said, he's here all through tomorrow. Um, so let's thank Ava again for a great talk. <laughs>